Welcome to Your Strata Property, the podcast for property owners looking for reliable, accurate and bite-sized information from an experienced and authoritative source. To access previous episodes and useful strata tips, go to www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. Hello and welcome. I'm Amanda Farmer and this is Your Strata Property. Dr. Nicole Johnston is an admitted legal practitioner currently working as a senior lecturer and researcher at Deakin University's Business School. She is a co-leader of Deakin's Home Research Group, an interdisciplinary research network. Nicole researches strata-related topics from a socio-legal perspective. Her work focuses on strata governance, conflicts of interest, purchaser knowledge acquisition, and building defects in residential schemes. She is the chair of the International Research Forum on Multi-Owned Properties, with a multidisciplinary research conference held annually. Today, I am delighted to welcome Dr. Nicole Johnston. Welcome, Nicole. Thanks very much for having me, Amanda. It is a pleasure to have you on the show, Nicole. This is actually your second time appearing as our guest on this podcast. I have chatted to you previously about the importance of purchasers doing their due diligence when they're buying strata properties, a really popular episode. And it's lovely to have you back. Now, some of our listeners may be very familiar with your name at this point in time because you have recently published an incredibly important report. It is titled An Examination of Building Defects in Residential Multi-Owned Properties. Now, you are the lead researcher on that report and it was co-authored with Dr. Sasha Reed of Griffith University. And I think, Nicole, this report was released, was it a few days before Mascot Towers then evacuated? Yes, that's right. So it's sort of been a bit of a unfortunate but fortunate um, coincidence that the report that really flagged some of these concerns that we're seeing in some of the issues that are arising, particularly at the moment in relation to Sydney, but are obviously much broader um, in relation to the impacts it's having across the country. But it just happened to, yes, coincidentally, the report came out at around the same time as Mascot Towers cracking mm. and we saw Um, you know, the unfortunate incidents with people having to evacuate from their homes. Yes. And you have been a busy lady since then. I know you've had lots of media commitments. You've been on the 7.30 report. You've been on ABC radio, interviewed for newspapers, for other radio stations. And so we are really privileged to have you with us here on the podcast today. And we are going to talk about the findings of your report and the research, the very good, incredibly important research that you've done. It is an incredibly comprehensive report. You're focusing on building defects arising during the early years, the period when the buildings still have some protection under our legislation. You looked particularly at New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria and the protections that we have in those states. You are defining the defects, looking at types of defects, their causes, their severity and their impact, looking at the regulatory environment. I'm going to put a link to this report in the show notes for this episode and I really strongly recommend that everyone goes and has a read of it. It's about 60 pages but I can tell you I flew through it because it's just fascinating stuff. The methodology that you used, you had an industry reference group, you analysed defects reports, you had stakeholder interviews and that's really what I want to get into in the chat with you today, Nicole, if that's okay. The interviews that you held, the questions that you asked and what you heard on the ground talking face-to-face with people experiencing building defects in residential strata properties. Yeah, that's great because it's really important that, you know, this project was not only about looking at sort of the quantitative type of data, like the hard data about what we're actually seeing in relation to defects in buildings, but it was also to have conversations with people and give them a voice to talk about what their experiences are and what their opinions are about in relation to the defects that are actually impacting so many buildings in this country. Mm, Incredibly important work. Why did you and maybe how did you make the decision to research in this area and to put together this particular report at this point in time? 
Yeah, so this has been in the works for several years, this particular project, but it's been something that has been discussed in the strata industry for many, many years. I've been a researcher in this area for nearly 12 years, and it's a topic that's been discussed by a lot of people involved in the strata sector, different strata conferences that I've been involved in for really that whole period of time. And I know it's been something that a lot of people in the profession have been jumping up and down, tearing their hair out really about why there hasn't been change affected um, in relation to building defects. And so I had done some previous work where I looked at different aspects in relation to developers and their responsibilities when they are creating new schemes. And a lot of the research that came out of that was in relation to building defects and some of the concerns around dealing with or rectifying defects and how difficult it is for owners in new buildings or them as the committee, an owner's corporation or a body corporate, how difficult it is for them to go through the process of having to deal with faulty buildings um, or buildings that have certain failures in different types of construction systems. And so it was something that had been discussed a lot and there was just very little research both internationally and in this country that really looked at, well, what are we talking about? What types of defects are we talking about? Why is it so difficult to construct quality buildings in this country and why is it then so difficult for people to go through the process of rectification? But also, more importantly, is that my focus with my research is always on the people that live or reside in these buildings. And so I often see, and I have seen for many years and had lots of conversation with strata owners um, and their concerns about what they have to go through in relation to dealing with some of these very complex defects and everything that sort of flows from that. So there's a lot of issues that flow from the fact that you've got a building with defects and how you go around the process of rectification. So it was time really, and, and I think, you know, amid the issues in relation to the combustible cladding crisis, it was time to really dig in because my position had always been that the combustible cladding issues were just really the tip of the iceberg and we knew that from conversations that were going on for years before this came to the fore was that there were some real concerns around other types of building defects and so it was really timing to start to dig down and find out and expose what's going on in these strata schemes. Mm, and indeed you have. I know there will be many listeners who have experienced firsthand the trauma that is building defects in their homes, strata managers who are managing properties with defects, working with committees, working with owners, professionals who are assisting those buildings to resolve these issues. And I know with your stakeholder interviews, you really uh, spoke to a representative, I think from each of those groups. Tell us how many you spoke to, uh, who they were, uh, where they were, and then we'll jump into some results from those interviews. Yes, sure. So we had 21 stakeholder or end user interviews. So this was a fairly small scale project. It was a pilot study. And so um, we were just trying to look at capturing the voices of people that were really impacted or were dealing with defects and defect rectification. So we spoke to stakeholders and end users from those three states, from Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. Um, many committee members were included in that stakeholder group or end user group and a number of managers also from each of those different states were included in the research project. Okay, excellent. And you asked them all a number of questions and I'm going to get into uh, just a few of those in today's podcast. But as I said, I do recommend that listeners go and read the full report because we're not going to be able to cover everything. And so much of this is really important for many of us to understand. Now, I know one of the things, Nicole, that you asked these stakeholders was about the type of building defects that they were observing. And you also did some, some hard data research around that. What were the most common building defects being observed? So when we did an analysis of a number of building audit reports across those three states, uh, there was fairly consistent data coming out of those three states. And what we did was it's quite difficult when you're talking about defects because there's some issues around how you define a defect and also then how you classify defects. So are you classifying them in relation to their causal link so that there's an installation failure, for example, or do you classify them in a different way? And so that was one of the complexities of this research project. And what we did over a period of time is decided that we would classify these defects 
in relation to where they were located within the building. So we were looking at specific construction systems. So we've got all different construction systems within our, our building and we were looking at the defects that were impacting upon those different systems. And so from the data that we collected and analysed from the audit reports, we found that building fabric and cladding, um, so this is basically the skin of the building and also the skin of your apartment, for example, so all those internal walls and ceilings and so forth, was the number one system that was impacted by defects. However, 33% of those defects really relate to water ingress. So it's they're resulting, what I've termed resulting defects, so they're defects due to something that is impacted, another type of defect that has impacted upon that building fabric and cladding system. So, for example, if there is a water membrane failure or if there's a problem in relation to the roof, so if a skylight, for example, hasn't been installed correctly and therefore water is ingressing or penetrating through the building, then oftentimes you'll get damage in relation to the skin of the building or the skin of your apartment, so those walls and those sorts of things. So that's why we saw quite a lot of defects that could be classified in that way. The second most prevalent construction system that we found that was impacted was fire protection, so the fire protection safety system. And again, it's very difficult to be in relation to the particular numbers, and I don't want people to focus too much on, on the actual numbers that have been reported because we really truly believe that fire protection systems and the failures in relation to those systems are much higher than reported because a lot of them are what we call latent defects. So they hide behind things and it's very difficult when you're just doing an observation to determine how defective those types of systems are. But stepping back from all that, really what we're seeing is probably the three main areas that are really problematic is in relation to water. Mm. water penetrating through the building, fire protection systems and then structural issues. Mm. And were you able to make an assessment of how much of the problem can be attributed to design issues? Are these problems with planning or are these problems that are arising during the actual construction phase? So that, that is a difficult question. It's really hard to get data to determine that. And that wasn't really the objective of the project. However, Previous research, you know, globally that have looked in relation to this have usually found that it's about a 50-50 mix in relation to whether it's a design or a construction-based defect. And I imagine speaking to stakeholders, talking to them about the impact that, for example, water penetration had on uh, committee members when you're talking to people who are owning these properties and living in these properties, the damage that water can do not only to property but to health and well-being. What were the observations there? Yeah, so water can be a very insidious thing, you know, it it gets into any sort of, you know, crack or opening within a building and so if you've got issues with that where you've got the flashings are missing around doors, you've got problems with your membranes, problems with skylights and so forth, the water will trickle into anywhere. It gets into every cavity and it moves through buildings and that's the problem. It gets everywhere and then it causes disruption. So it's not just simply that water is coming through and it's a nuisance, it's also the impacts of that. So you get property damage in relation to that, you get weakening of the structures internally within a building and of course what we're seeing and what I'm really concerned about, and I think more people need to be concerned about it, is the impact that mould has in buildings and on people's health. And so this is something that I think we need to do more research on. Mm. Um, I know, I've, and I've been given numerous photos of rooms and apartments that are basically covered in mould. It's, it's extraordinary to see the nature and the movement of mould when you've got water sort of laying in, in different aspects of a property. And then, you know, as a number of people said to me, you know, people are living there with basically mushrooms coming out of their carpets mm. and the health impacts. And I think there hasn't been enough research to look at how the health impacts in, in relation to mould there has been. But I think it's something that we should be very concerned about, especially in relation to our respiratory system and how mould can impact upon that. And so the amount of mould that I have seen, the photos that have been shown to me about how much mould there are, is just absolutely extraordinary. And I think one of the main concerns is then how do trades or people that are doing rectification works 
deal with this type of thing, deal with mould. Because from the conversations that we had with a number of stakeholders, especially people that deal with rectification, is that not enough care is taken when people are removing flooring and um, the internal lightweight cladding and those areas that are impacted by mould. When they're being removed through the rectification process, um, there's not a lot of care being taken. And of course, the spores then can embed in other aspects or in other parts of the apartment and then you've still got the same problem. So you have, you know, basically a second generation of mould issues after your apartment, for example, has been rectified. Wow. So not only are we getting it wrong at the stage of construction and the water is able to penetrate, first of all, then we're getting it wrong when we're trying to fix it as well. That's yeah, that's right. Really and, scary. you know, a number of um, really, f- I spoke to a number of great people that deal with rectification and they said one of the problems for them is that there's not a lot of guidance in relation to the regulatory framework in assisting them how to rectify a building that is defective. And so a lot of them, you know, they're just trying to determine some guidelines as they go. So we've got some concerns over, well, do we see second generation issues with defects like we have seen in New Zealand with the leaky building crisis? I've spoken to a lot of people there that say that, you know, they're often at their now third generation of uh, leaks in buildings across that country. So we need to get this right now. We've got the defects. We need to make sure that we're rectifying these buildings correctly so people don't have to go through this again. Mm. Better yet, let's construct them properly in the first place. And I know uh, getting back to the the findings in your interviews, you were asking stakeholders uh, what they thought the cause of these problems were. You asked them about the regulatory environment. Are our laws good enough, in short? You asked them about whether the private certification system is flawed. Tell us a bit about the stakeholders' views on our laws and private certification in particular. Yeah, so this is the difficult thing about now going ahead and trying to fix what I would say is a broken system is that the causal parts of it are complex and varied. And so what we've got to be careful of that we don't sort of take a Band-Aid type of approach to try and fix what's happened with this system. There are a number of different issues that we need to not only research further to get a better understanding, but we need to have a look at this all holistically to be able to solve the problem. And so in relation to the regulatory system, so again, many stakeholders had concerns in relation to the overarching regulatory system. There are a lot of laws that regulate different aspects of construction. We have a national construction code which sets minimum technical standards in relation to our construction environment and there are concerns about having minimum standards. Shouldn't we be looking at best practice was what a number of people um, spoke to me about. They also spoke to me about the difference between the Australian standards that is a reference document that sits within the national construction code and Australian standards actually cost money. You know, people have to buy these standards. Um, And so the question is, in a regulatory environment, why do trades that need these standards in order to provide guidance when they're constructing? Why do they need to pay for these particular standards? And there's also, uh, from the interview data, suggestions that there is an inconsistency or a disconnection really between the Australian standards and the National Construction Code. So we definitely need to have a little look at that. We need to do more research on this type of regulatory system, which is called a performance-based code. So it's very different to a lot of our other laws in this country. It's a different type of regulatory environment that has been created to enable flexibility when we're constructing these sorts of buildings. So we have some concerns in relation to that. And then, of course, Each state has its own legislation in relation to things like registering and licensing systems. And, you know, and we're seeing this also in relation to the combustible cladding crisis about what to do with that particular product. So there's lots of variation, lots of different approaches that are being used. And so there are concerns about sort of the haphazard manner in which reform is taking place in relation to this particular area. In relation to the private certification system, yes, most people that we spoke to were very clear that it's a flawed or broken system. But many commentators said to me that there is a real disconnect between what we as the public believe the certification system is about, what we believe the role of a certifier is, and what their actual statutory function is. And so we 
as individual private citizens that, you know, move into these buildings that are being provided with an occupancy certificate, we're moving in on the belief that there has been some really good oversight and those buildings are actually constructed in a manner that is of high quality. And so the disconnect comes with we believe that a private certifier is there to oversee the construction of that building, that there is an independence there. And the fact is that under each of the legislation in the various jurisdictions, that there are a number of times, a small number of times that a private certifier is required to go on site and have a look at these particular construction systems. They're not looking at every particular element or every particular product that's installed on a building. And so they are highly reliant on other trades, other people that are there in the builder to ensure that anyone that's coming onto site that is in installing or constructing, including any type of building element, is doing it in accordance with the relevant legislation and that it's being compliantly done. And so basically what a lot of certifiers are doing is they're gathering different documents and they're going through those documents and really they're highly reliant on other people. And so there's really that disconnect between that. Another aspect, of course, is in relation to conflicts of interest. There's a lot of concerns in relation to who appoints the private certifier, the developer is the one that appoints the private certifier. And in any time where you've got these sort of conflicted interests, it's problematic because the certifier is getting their future work potentially from that particular developer. And so self-interest can come to the fore very easily in relation to these sorts of incidences and are certainly are of concern. Mm. And I want to dig in a little bit uh, in a moment about that question of the responsibilities of developers. But just going back to being reliant on trades, on the people who are actually doing the work, is it the case that there is work that is simply not being done properly, that's substandard, uh, done by unqualified people? I know you asked a question about the role that human error plays in contributing to defects. Does it play a significant role? Yeah, so we don't know, we don't have any specific stats, for example, to say, you know, what element is contributing more or less to these defects. But certainly from the conversations that we had with a lot of stakeholders in this area, that was certainly a concern. That combined with the fact that a lot of buildings over the last probably, you know, 12 years or so have been pushed up very quickly because of the demand um, in relation to higher density living. And so there's pressure points. So there's the more pressure you apply to get a building completed. Unfortunately, human error then becomes more of an issue in relation to these particular buildings. And so then you get trades, you know, sort of over each other as they sort of start to construct. And so the oversight or the supervision becomes a little bit more lax because there are so many people on site, so many people sort of jumping over each other to try and get this work done. And if one particular trade, you know, for whatever reason doesn't get their work done in a particular time period and the other trades have to come in, you're sort of you're getting an environment where, of course, um, it's more difficult to have that sort of oversight or that supervision. And so I think you have a number of problems there. And I think also some of the trades don't have the necessary education standards or requirements in relation to qualification to do certain works. And we're certainly seeing that in relation to waterproofing, where, you know, the waterproofing industry, and I've spoken to some really amazing people in in waterproofing that have been concerned about this for a very long time have really come together as a group and and made sort of advances to government to say this needs to be fixed and this is what you need to do to fix this. But unfortunately, they've been largely ignored. And so they've been very clear about ensuring that TAPEs have specific modules in place in relation to waterproofing, the different types of waterproofing systems that are available, the different products that are available to ensure the the right type of waterproofing is put in the right type of areas and those sorts of things. And so they're concerned that you're getting people on site that really do not have those skills um, or particular qualifications to be able to do those sorts of works. And so those sorts of things are a real concern. So it's it's education, it's training, it's time pressures on site. It's the fact that we've got a development industry where a lot of developers may not have you know, building experience as such. It's a different type of role. And so ensuring that they get the right type of people or they engage the right type of builder to ensure that oversight um, is also being raised as a concern. So there are a number of different elements that sort of come together to create what we're seeing um, in relation to what I would say is a building defect crisis. 
Mm, it really is the uh, perfect storm of problems, isn't it? And I know that uh, part of your research revealed that it is indeed the less experienced developers who are maybe building a strata property for the first time that seem to have most of the problems which is important for consumers to know. Yeah, so we did actually have a little bit of variation in relation to that. It seems that the builders that have been around for a much longer time that have what we would say is, you know, good reputation of capital that they want to safeguard, and they are the types of companies that normally come back to try and do what they can to rectify these sort of defects in a fairly timely manner. But we have seen instances, and a a number of, of stakeholders said to us, that in some respects you don't see much difference between those sorts of building companies. So we need to do a little bit more work in in that area just where the sort of those top tier builders are doing a better job. I suspect in in most cases that they are because of their reputation in the marketplace. And, you know, I, I would suggest that probably those builders or developers that haven't been in the market very, very long or are doing small scale sorts of things, especially if they've got time pressures, maybe the ones that are becoming more problematic. But I think we've seen it across all different types of builders and developers. Now, Nicole, in your report, you cite some previous research, which I know includes your own PhD thesis, to the point that the rectification process for our strata buildings is often made more difficult because of what you call common practices undertaken by developers to attempt to stifle the ability of owners' corporations to seek legal recourse when it comes to rectifying defects. What are you talking about there and how does this happen? Yeah, so there's probably two main points in relation to that. The first thing is that developers um, and, you know, builders, anyone that's going to be responsible in relation to building defects, they're very aware of the time limitation periods that are set out in each of the the relevant legislation in each of the states. So they know if they can get past that limitation period, then they're basically off the hook. And so they're very aware of that. So, of course, especially if there are large defects that are starting to occur that are really going to be very problematic and going to really impact upon their bottom line, there is a common practice of trying to push out any issues in relation to those defects as much as they possibly can. Oftentimes what we were seeing and this has come out of the interviews is that small and minor type of defects will be fixed in an orderly fashion. So the communication will continue between the owner's corporation, usually through their manager, to the developer to come back and fix and have the builder come back and fix those minor sorts of defects. Anything that's larger, what we're seeing is those conversations continue, but they, the conversations get to a point where they're stifled because it may become very clear that they've got some major issues here that they need to deal with and they'll try and delay anything, de- delay communications, delay taking any steps to rectify um, in order to get past that particular limitation period. And so it's really if you've engaged a manager, um, it is going to probably fall back on the manager to ensure that they are not necessarily advising, but they're the conduit between those two parties and to ensure that perhaps a lawyer gets involved to give some legal advice and some legal instructions around how to deal with that particular process early on. So that's one part is sort of trying to push out those dates is a real problem. The other problem, as I I have spoken about this before, is the relationship between the manager, the strata manager, and the developer in new schemes. And so we've been speaking about this now for a number of years and, and um, the practice will, it seemingly will continue until there is some sort of regulatory prohibition. And there is in New South Wales, but there's still some ways to get around that from my understanding. And so what you see there is you've got sort of really the manager becomes a bit of the piggy in the middle because they get their work from developers as well. So there is a conflict of interest issue there. So they are obviously always looking for new schemes to include into their management business. And so there's that relationship and the relationships usually start with um, a structuring arrangement early on um, in the planning of a new scheme. And so the um, manager often does work for little or no fee in relation to setting up the original, you know, there's might be some documentation, getting the first annual general meeting, getting the levies and the budget sorted and those sorts of things. And they do that because they usually get that a contract for a period of time with the owners corporation to manage that particular scheme. And so my argument has always been there is a real problem in relation to that type of relationship. And of course, when you're getting your future work from a developer, 
oftentimes there is that sort of positive relationship that you want to keep going forward. So if a building then has a lot of defects and if the developer or the builder is reluctant to deal with some of those more complex defects, well, then it does become a very difficult relationship because the manager has duties, they owe duties to their client, which is the owner's corporation, and they need to work in their best interests when dealing with this. So it does become a bit of a concern. And I have seen instances where managers just simply don't bring these, these conversations to the fore in relation to general meetings, don't take active steps in relation to ensuring that an audit report is undertaken early on in the, in the scheme's life. And so there has been major issues in relation to that. And I think we have to put some more education around ensuring that managers managing this process much better. And I'm not against, I think managers play the, one of the most fundamental roles in relation to dealing with defects. It's There's some real complexities to it, understanding how defects arise, what type of defects they're seeing. You need to have a bit of an understanding of buildings and, and how they're constructed. And so, you know, it's something that the managers don't often have those sort of of experiences um, if they haven't been involved in the building game before. And there's sort of legal complications about these limitation periods. What is a defect? Um, what's a minor and major defect? And, and, you know, what process that a building needs to go through or an owner's corporation needs to go through to deal with these sorts of rectifications. It's a really complex process. And I think we certainly need to get more guidance for managers in dealing with that process more. Mm. And we certainly have had some legislative reform in New South Wales that attempts to deal with these problems of having what might be a developer-friendly strata manager appointed to manage the scheme. But I do agree with you, Nicole. I don't believe that those changes are solving these problems. And my guidance for new buildings is to make sure that they, the owners who have purchased, are aware of the relationship that the developer and the strata manager may have, which might not be an obvious commercial connection, but certainly understanding if the strata manager has been there holding the hand, if you like, of the developer for a few years, helping them to set up their bylaws and to understand how strata schemes operate. And then that is the same manager who is then recommended for appointment by the scheme at the first AGM to understand who that manager is and whether they are in fact the best person to be managing your building. And I think always ensuring that short appointment terms in those early years are what's in the contract. And we do have limits on that in New South Wales, but one year is certainly different to three years when you're stuck with a strata manager who you might think is not progressing the rectification of your building defects and the clock is ticking. So just being aware of these issues so that you can go and seek more information and understand what your rights are is really important. Yeah, because in other states that we have longer time periods or even in New South Wales where inertia is something that keeps things going. So oftentimes new people into a scheme aren't really aware about how the owners corporation or the body corporate works. And so, you know, that first AGM comes around very, very quickly. Um, and it does even in three-year schemes. And if you're still just trying to understand, you know, how this all works, oftentimes it's just easy to appoint the person who's there in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, they obviously want to keep your work, of course, course, you know, they've got a commercial interest here. So um, it's often easy just to then sign the next three-year contract or sign whatever contract to keep it going because the work that it takes to go out and look at other managers and interview other managers and see whether they're going to be a natural fit is a lot of work for volunteer people on an owner's corporation. So sort of that inertia happens and then you're still in that limitation period. So what we see often is these defects, especially in relation to water, will arise after a big major storm event, um, which often happens in that sort of, you know, three or four year period. And then people are going to have to deal with that and deal with the manager that, that has been appointed in that period of time. Mm. And very often people have bought off the plan. They may be first home buyers. It's their first experience of not only owning an apartment, but property ownership. And this is certainly not the kind of thing that they expected to be faced with. And uh, it can be very easy to put your head in the sand, so to speak, or to think, oh, others are looking after me. The builder is still around. The strata manager is looking after me. But being aware that that may not necessarily be the case. And it is in the best interest of your investment that you pay attention to these issues. 
Absolutely. And, and that's the difficult thing here because there should be a reasonable expectation that when you buy in to a strata scheme, that everything has been done compliantly and in accordance with the different regulations and that people are open and transparent and accountable for their actions and that really what it is is it's just then setting up the scheme for for it to be a functional, viable scheme moving forward. So all these issues, especially with building defects, because the problem with that is that they're systemic and dealing with them usually takes quite a long time to deal with them. So it's not something that doesn't get fixed very quickly. And so unfortunately, people go into these buildings hoping that they've bought into something that, you know, should be safe and secure and been built to a fairly good quality. And then they're faced with dealing with the reality of a building that may have failures. And so it becomes a much more difficult task for people and they can't shy away from it. They can't bury their heads in the sand. They do have to deal with it. And it is very unfortunate that this is the situation, but, you know, this is what we've got at the moment until we start to deal better with the quality of construction in this building. This is what more owners are going to have to be faced with. Mm. Well, let's talk about the future. What were your conclusions and your recommendations for change arising out of your research? So some of the conclusions were that there's real complexities here. There are many issues that need to be dealt with. And and I think, you know, taking a more holistic approach is what is really needed here. I think we can't just start looking at things in isolation. We do need to have a look at what's going on much more broadly. I think as far as clear solutions and recommendations, it's really hard. And that really wasn't the whole point of the project. The project was really just to identify what was going on in the marketplace. But I do believe that we've got some very talented and skilled people in this country that are very, very concerned in relation to the quality of buildings. I've been contacted by hundreds of people that have raised these concerns, have shown me documentation about raising these concerns over many, many, many years and have been largely ignored. And so it's time now for have those people at the table. These people understand construction, they understand quality construction, they understand what needs to happen in relation to their area of expertise and it's time that they come to the table and for governments to really understand what's going on. I think some of the states are becoming much more aware that there's a real issue. And I think the New South Wales government has come out and been very clear that, you know, they can see that there's a problem, that this is a crisis point in relation to building defects more broadly. But then other states are really just, you know, putting their head in the sand in relation to this. And I think it's really irresponsible, to be quite frank, to ignore what is happening in relation to building defects. And so I think, you know, this is not just about combustible lighting, as I've said before, this is this is bigger than that. And just ignoring it's not going to make these problems go away. And they don't stop at any border. The cracking issues that we're seeing in New South Wales, they don't just stop at the border. <laughs> you know, what we've seen is these same issues are played out in all the different states. No state is particularly unique in this respect. And so I think we just need to have a bigger conversation about this and get people that are really good at this area to come together and start formulating some solutions. Mm, And I know that your report is going to be a key piece of that conversation. And I'm sure you will, if if of course you don't already, Nicole, have a seat at that table and being a big part of that discussion is going to be um, very helpful. And I think this industry owes a great debt to you for doing the hard work that you have done and for being so candid and open discussing these real problems, which, as you said, have been around for a long time. People have been talking about them, but we haven't had the right people listening. So now's the time. That's great. Yeah, I think we can't shy away from this issue. I think um, it's important and it's impacting upon people's lives, um, their financial future, the value of property, Uh, The list goes on and on. And so the impact and the damage that these building defects can cause, again, are widespread and um, we can't afford to have another year or two years go by where people aren't concentrating on finding solutions in relation to this crisis. Mm, For sure. Now we're about to wrap up, unfortunately. Uh, Thank you so much, Nicole, for sharing your time with us. Is there anything you want to add before we close out the conversation and certainly let our listeners know where they can find out more about you. 
Yeah, so um, you're welcome to, I've got a LinkedIn page for those that are on LinkedIn. Um, it's I'm pretty easy to find on LinkedIn. So you're welcome to, you know, link in with me. And I put up the report is on LinkedIn. And I also, some of the conversations around that um, are also on LinkedIn. So please, you know, I you know, encourage you to do that. I'm also available. I've, I've got a Deakin, you can go onto Deakin University website. And there's a profile in relation to me and how to contact me if you like. And of course, a lot of our research in relation to Strata is on a publicly open website, which is the Multi-Owned Properties Research Hub. Um, if you Google that, you can go and see a lot of research that uh, not only myself, but a number of academics, um, not only in this country, but in the world, we um, openly put up our um, research for so people can read that as well. So there's a couple of different options to see what's going on um, in this space. But I think, thank you very much for your time, Amanda, to sort of allow me to have a chat about this research and hopefully we'll continue to get funded and to be able to look into these issues in much more detail. I will make sure that there are links in the show notes to the report and examination of building defects in residential multi-owned properties and also to the multi-owned properties research hub. I really look forward to the continued work that I know you're doing, Nicole, and that you plan to do in this space and the impact that this research is going to have. I'm sure we'll have you back on the show very soon. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you for listening to Your Strata Property, the podcast which consistently delivers to property owners reliable and accurate information about their strata property. You can access all the information below this episode via the show notes at www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. You can also ask questions in the comments section, which Amanda will answer in her upcoming episodes. How can Amanda help you today? today?